So how many of you think that hair is important? I do, obviously. Um, I think about maybe why we even have hair. I don't know, most people might guess that we have hair to keep warm for thermal protection, but I'm talking about this hair up here, and I just don't think there's enough. It can't be for keeping us warm, even this hair. The hair we have on our arms and legs, completely different from this hair, but still not enough to keep us warm. I think maybe in prehistory, uh, somebody like me, before shampoos and brushes and stuff, I could have had a big mass of hair around my head that used, was like a helmet for protection or, or maybe a pillow. But uh, I don't think so, not enough. But whatever reason we have hair, it is tremendously important to our biology. I mean, let's think about how much hair we actually grow. We have about 100 scalp hair, 100,000 scalp hairs and each one of them grows at 0.3 millimeters per day. So about a centimeter a month, or 33 meters a day, or pretty close to two meters of hair per hour. That's a lot of hair. And we spend a lot of energy on it. A joule is a measure of energy. And to grow one gram of hair, so a gram of hair is just a little bit like this at the end, 630 kilojoules of biological energy. So 630 kilojoules, that's just about the same as 10 minutes of vigorous exercises using both your arms and legs, like jumping jacks or dancing. 10 minutes. That's a lot of biological energy. So that makes our hair a keen barometer of our health. When everything, whenever anything goes wrong with us, one of the first things that changes is we see more hair fall out. This could be from stress, like when you're taking a big examination. It could be from a crash diet. Could be even from a high fever. It's also one of the reasons why you lose your hair when you have uh, uh, cancer therapy, chemotherapy. Cancer cells are really rapidly growing. And so cancer chemotherapy is designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. And some of the most rapidly dividing cells in your body are in the hair follicle. So they get killed as damage and you see your hair fall out. Another reason that hair is important is because it really is a basis for who we are. And I will let you know, I am uniquely qualified to talk about how hair is a part of your identity. This is me. This is me about 45 minutes later. So I'll tell you about the first time I cut my hair. It was long, it was about down to here, more than I've got now. Uh, for about 20 years, I've been growing out my hair and then getting it cut so that I can donate it to charity. The first time I did that, it was because I had this long hair and I was just having a not good hair day. And any, anybody that's got long hair out there can appreciate this, I'd had enough. I just could not deal with this hair anymore. Jumped in the car, drove to a salon, cut it off. Every bit, down to about three centimeters. I, on a whim, I thought, this will be good. I called up my wife and I said, let's meet in a bar and have a beer on the way home from work. Yeah, she said, that's a great idea. We picked a place, we picked a bar. Uh, I sat, I, I jumped in the car, drove over there, sat at the bar near the door where I could see the bar and see her come in. So right on time, she walks in and starts looking around. Now, we've been together at this point for six years, married for two, and she looks right at me. Doesn't recognize me, right? I can see her, she's getting annoyed, right? Because first, I'm always late, so she assumes since I'm not there, I'm late. But second, there's this creepy weirdo at the bar that's staring her down. No clue, right? And I reached down and I picked up the ponytail I'd cut off and I held it up. <laughs> she recognized me, it was like a shocked moment. And I'll tell you, I've repeated this experiment five times over the last 20 years, it almost always works. Doesn't work on her anymore, but almost always works on somebody else. Uh, this is also obvious with hair disease. We see this a lot in hair disease. There's a couple of hair diseases where people's hair falls out really rapidly, maybe overnight. The most common one is called alopecia areata. 
And what happens with alopecia areata is your immune system decides that your hair follicles are actually a foreign invader and it wipes them out. So overnight, people will lose essentially all their hair. I've met a lot of people with alopecia areata and they are very passionate about hair. You might be able to imagine. There's even a book of poetry that's written by alopecia areata sufferers. You can get it from the foundation, it's a fundraiser. But throughout this poetry, there's a continual theme and it's about their identity and their missing identity. They get up in the morning and they look in the mirror and they don't know who's there. So I want you to think about that for a second. Looking in the mirror and what it would be like to see a stranger staring back at you. So hair is important to everybody. But I wanna tell you, and you all know this, from our society's viewpoint, hair is clearly and obviously different between men and women. Men go bald. Sure, guys in their late 20s, early 30s, they stress about it and they might do some treatments and stuff. But as a general rule, men go bald and it's okay. A lot of men even shave their head. In our society, bald men or men with shaved heads, perfectly normal, sexy. This is not the case with women. For whatever reason, our society views hair very differently from men and women. And one way that you see this is in this concept of a good hair day. Hair, starting off the day with good hair, can provide confidence, self-confidence. And that confidence enables better social interactions, um, more connections, higher satisfaction, and more fulfillment. This is the ladder to happiness. Okay, hair is important. But you know, despite the fact that hair is basal to our biology, that we expend all this energy on it, that it's a foundation for our happiness, it's a foundation for our identity, we still know shockingly little about hair. So let's take a little uh, tour of what we actually know about hair. It won't take very long. From a biological viewpoint, the hair follicle is amongst our most complex organs. It's got everything. It's got quiescent stem cells. It's got rapidly proliferating cells. It's got cells moving across a shear plane while stuck against a solid connective tissue layer. It's got a little muscle. It's that one that makes your hair stand up on end, you know, it's called piloerection. Uh, your hair's got a nerve to drive that. It's got blood vessels to feed it. And so not only is hair this, the, the hair follicle this complicated, it goes away and comes back multiple times throughout our life. That's right, I'm 56, but I don't have any 56-year-old hair follicles. Every 10 or 15 years, we really don't know how long, hair follicles will just magically decide that they've had enough. The hair stops growing, the follicle regresses, the hair falls out, and then rests up for a while, and then it starts again, grows a new one, totally new hair comes back. And that cycling is one of the reasons that we experience hair loss, because frequently what happens is, whenever that hair cycles and it comes back, it's not quite as good as it was before. And in balding men, when it cycles, it doesn't come back at all. But if we think the biology's complicated, from a chemistry viewpoint, hair may be even more complicated. Hair starts as a single protein thread. Eight of those wrapped together make a microfibril. Eight of those wrapped together again make a macrofibril. A bunch of those wrapped together into another strand that makes the center of the hair the cortex. Then that's wrapped in an in a armor plate. And then all the empty space packed with a soft, squishy matrix and uh, cross-linked together. It makes one of the strongest and most flexible fibers known. Hair, as a matter of fact, is stronger than equivalent piece of steel wire. Stronger than spider silk. Why do we do this? Why do we generate all of this biology? I don't know. I've got no idea. We, what we do know about hair is vastly overshadowed by what we don't. We don't know most of the basics of hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I know a dozen, two dozen genes that I can put her around with in a mouse and cause her hair to fall out or cause them to have funny hair. I can even make mice that look like little Angora fuzzballs. I even can give you a half a dozen genes that cause human beings to have hair with a very different structure or no hair or too much hair. But knowing the genes doesn't mean we know how they work. All these years, there's only two treatments for hair loss that have been shown to be effective. And they're both drugs, and they were both discovered totally by accident, a side effect of a drug discovery program looking for some completely different benefit. As a matter of fact, humans have been trying to grow hair where they don't have it and get rid of hair where they don't want it for all of recorded history. The oldest medical text available to us today is an Egyptian papyrus called the Ebers Papyrus. It's from 1550 BC, or a little bit more than 3,500 years ago. The first medical textbook that we've ever found, and it has a hair growth recipe in it. I looked at it, I mean, I read the recipe. It, it makes sense. I, I haven't tried it yet, maybe I should. But you know, despite all this, despite the fact that we don't know very much about hair, despite the fact that we've worked on it for a long time, there's a ray of hope. Science and technology are moving forward at a phenomenal pace. There are tools available to me as a researcher now that I would never have dreamed of 20 years ago when I started working on hair research. And we have to couple that with some creative thinking. And an example I'll give is a recent breakthrough where it started with an epiphany. We were thinking, how do we make a product? How do we change hair? How do we do this? And what we came up with was men and women might be different. That seems obvious to us right now, I know, but it wasn't then. All the hair research had been on men. And then it was like, wait a minute, maybe hair loss in men and women is different. So we looked, and it is. When men lose hair, they lose hairs. A spot goes bald, they're gone. When women lose hair, they lose hair. Each individual hair stays there, it's just smaller. So we figured out some treatments and put together a cocktail where it actually made women's hairs a little bit bigger around. And we learned that math was on our side again because how much hair you feel like you have, this volume, is dependent on the diameter of the hair shaft. And the hair shaft's volume increases with the square of the radius. So a little bitty difference makes something you can feel. A small difference squared, then multiplied by 100,000 hairs, means that you get a benefit. Women feel it and they love it. So it was a small benefit, but it was the beginning, I think, of something that we could actually make work. So hair is important. If hair is so important, if it's basic to our biology and our biochemistry, if it's a foundation for our socialization, our happiness, even our very identity, could we please invest in some basic science to build an understanding of hair's biology, hair's function, hair's chemistry, and then apply that understanding to the development of new, innovative, uh, and impactful uh, hair care products and treatments for hair loss. Thank you.